Hello, welcome all to Where Are the Limits event. It's so fantastic to see the house so full. I haven't seen it this full ever. <laughs> We are the hosts of this event. I am Susanna Lehvävirta, the director of HELSUS, Helsinki Sustainability Science Institute. Warm welcome. My name is Toni Ruska. I'm a university researcher and a docent in sustainable economy. Welcome to this event, uh, coordinated by HELSUS and arranged together by CITRA, KELA and Club of Rome Finnish Association. And to get started, we would like to welcome to the stage our rector, rector of University of Helsinki, Sari Lindblom, and our Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Maria Ohisalo. Please welcome. I, I just going to uh, stand, stand by by saying welcome all. It is a great pleasure to, to open this uh, seminar from my behalf as well, and especially to invite Minister Ohisalo alumni of our university to, to visit here as, as a Minister of Environment. And this is really important for us, so you are warmly welcome here. Thank you very much. Always great to be here and always good to see so many people after these COVID times or maybe I cannot say after, but I have to say after the worst year or two and now we've, I think we're happy to have so much science, for example, that we have vaccinations that enable us to be here. If I start by saying that this topic today related to responsibility and sustainability is absolutely important for the University of Helsinki, but also for the whole globe. globe. And maybe you know that in our strategy of the university, we want to do the best for the world with the power of knowledge. And we really think seriously that our alumni will save the globe by, by doing important research and sol solving very trickle, trick, tricky problems. So how does it look from the minister's perspective? Yeah, I actually studied social politics here at the University of Helsinki and I'm really thankful for the, those years and I actually was able to study uh, environmental politics also as part of social politics because they obviously go hand in hand. And this is actually one of the key, um, key cornerstones of my thinking when it comes to environmental politics that we need to do environmental politics at the same time when we do this uh, just transition and, and fair change in a society, that we actually keep everybody involved all the time. We don't push anyone into the sides, because we need everybody. We need everybody's um, um, support in this change, and, and the government level, of course, and then on the municipal level, politics and politicians can offer these tools that everybody stays along. And, and this is why I think uh, University of Helsinki gave me a lot of um, seeds of, of of thought and uh, later on I, I did my PhD in another university uh, but it was uh, related to poverty and, and social exclusion. And, and as you mentioned that everybody needs to be involved and I, I really think that what we do at the University of Helsinki, we are about 40,000 people, maybe a little bit more and our actions really can make a difference to the whole society and also internationally. And there is a very, very big push from our students, 32,000 students, that they require from us to really not only do research on sustainability and responsibility or teach those topics, but also are heavily involved in actions related to that one. And I would like to ask you, how do you see that from your point of view as a, as a minister of, of, of environment, how, what would be the most important critical um, topics on actions at the moment. We've, during this governmental period, we've done actually, 
I would have to say, a historical thing in a governmental program and in our actions. None of the governments before in Finland has done uh, such a long-term plan regarding uh, um, climate neutrality. So we set up a goal that Finland would become the first uh, welfare state that would become uh, climate neutral by 2035. And we are on that path right now. But we need to, at the same time, when we lower emissions, we need to take care of the carbon sinks. And Finland is known as a country of a lot of forests, and forestry has been one of the big uh, industrial fields in Finland. But we need to rethink our use of wood in many ways so that we really are in the path towards uh, coal neutrality uh, or carbon, carbon neutrality. But um, I think this is something that... Uh, is definitely something that not just the politicians can do. We are definitely going to need research all the time. Um, and actually the new Climate Act, which was now came into force in July, it set goals um, towards this uh, carbon neutrality. And these goals were actually made by um, a climate panel that is formed of researchers and data. And this is something that politics should always be uh, based on. Uh, not just ideas here and there, but we need researchers all the time more and more. We need dialogue, we need constant action from researchers' side. And I actually have a lot of entrepreneurs and, and a lot of uh, NGOs coming to me, sending messages. I have a lot of connections with these. But I would wish that more and more scientists would also come up and, and, and uh, like they, I would love to see more challenging also from that side, that universities are here to also challenge politicians all the time, that we can do and we must do even more and better and faster. That's what you say about the importance of uh, making political decisions based on research evidence, it is really music to my ears. But also I think you are very right in that we as researchers need to be active in, in pushing our views and really, really, really showing evidence in a way that anybody in the politi political side can, uh, can follow the, the, the research results. I think it's really, really important. And maybe sustainability and responsibility is a very good example of how, how, how research comes into actions or, or reforms its, itself into actions, which is really, really important. But I also acknowledge that sometimes as a politician, I guess it's really difficult to follow because researchers don't always agree of topics, but this is how research goes or scientific knowledge evolves that there are different opinions, but from an outsider's point of view, it might be difficult to follow what we really think. Yes, sometimes can be like that, and I, then I think that having a background in research helps me as a politician, because I know how to dig information from a lot of information, like a flow of information. And also the idea that I want to have experts sitting in the same round table discussing these things, because as you say, this is one part of science, that science is a constant dialogue and constant finding new ideas together. And, and that is also something what I sometimes miss from my research researcher times that uh, we came to same tables and, and left the room with head full of so many new th thoughts that we were never able to, to find by ourselves, that it's a collective, uh, collective act. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree and it is really important for researchers that they, they really can see their, their importance in, in, in societies around around universities and, and the most important it is for our students that they really see that when we graduate from university at whatever uh, level, whether they are masters or doctors, that they, they really can change the, the future. We, we talk, she will talk a little bit about future, and then we'll stop. If possible. 
Yes. One minute. Uh, so, as I mentioned, this path towards climate neutrality, it's something that we now started. We have a new climate act. We have so many fields of society doing this work all the time, not just us politicians, because we're going to need everybody. What next? Of course, I think the next government should continue on this path. And I think that we need to take uh, sustainability and, and biodiversity loss in general, this topic should come hand in hand together with climate change all the time. And actually this autumn is really important. I hope that you're following uh, United Nations Biodiversity COP that is uh, going to be held in, in Montreal. It's only every 10th year that this is uh, happening. And I hope that countries around the world will say that we will stop biodiversity loss by 2030. Imagine that we have said that it, we're going to do it 2010, 2020, and now we say it's going to be 2030. And I hope we stick to this. And I think next government should also act a lot in, in this field, because uh, if ecosystems start falling, we have no future in this planet, we have no jobs, we have no economics. Uh, this is the base. And we have to stick our human actions into the limits uh, of that nature puts, puts on us. Well said, and thank you so much for your work, and especially for your work to linking research with political decisions. And thank you for coming. Thank you very much, everybody. So thank you a lot. Uh, I'm so glad to have uh, two such determined people in leading positions in Finland. I hope with uh, their leadership and uh, our joint power we can stop the degradation of our planet Earth. Yes, let's dig into the predicament that we're in. So 50 years ago, the Club of Rome commissioned a report, The Limits to Growth. By presenting 12 different scenarios, the report claimed that if the growth in the consumption of natural resources and human population would not be curtailed, contemporary societies would likely face collapses during the 21st century. Unfortunately, the main messages of the report were largely ignored which has meant the continuation of the destructive and unsustainable economic and societal development. By arranging this event, we want to ask that after 50 years of reporting on ecological overshoot, and as we are facing a deepening ecological crisis, are we finally ready for change? Are we ready to move beyond growth? I think this is a heavy question, and with this preface, I would like to welcome to the stage Mr. Jörgen Randers, please. <laughs> Professor Randers is an emeritus of climate, climate strategy at the BI Norwegian Business School. Uh, you work on issues of the future, especially related to sustainability, climate, energy, and system dynamics. He has spent one third of his life in academia, one third in business, and one third in NGO world. So quite the diversity. And Professor Anders has written many papers and books, starting with this co-authoring this one, but more recent writings include, for example, a global forecast for the next 40 years, which was published in 2012, and Transformation is Feasible, with other authors in 2018, and just day before yesterday, uh, there was a book that was published titled Earth for All, a survival guide for humanity together with five other prestigious authors. Now today, Jörgen Randers is going to give us uh, his keynote talk on the topic from the 
limits the growth to earth for all, a hundred years perspective. So let's give him once more a warm applaud and welcome his talk. Well, she forgot the most important thing. I am Norwegian and I have a PhD from one of the finest technological institutions in the world, namely Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And I'm even able to express this in words. MIT is much easier to say. Second, she forgot to tell that I am the most depressed 77-year-old person you're likely to meet. But I have a... F uh -huh. So someone turn off something. Uh, I am the most depressed 77-year-old person you are likely to meet. But since I've given this talk for 50 years, I've learned that if I have a smiling face, you know, the whole thing works much better. You know, then you clap and you're enthusiastic afterwards. Although, in reality, I am really depressed after having tried for 50 years in vain to get the world to move in a sustainable direction. So, then, I have a timer here because I speak much more much longer than most people, and so it's hard to keep within the 40 minutes. And I also have a manuscript, so that we're sure that I don't run over time. First, I should, of course, say that I'm absolutely delighted about being invited back to Finland. I have been here several times during the last 30 years, and I'm always pleased when a customer invites me back, you know, because that means that at least it was not total waste last time I was here. I'm impressed with Finland. You know, Finland's ability to do things and to look forwards is far exceeding you know, that of most other nations. So that's a compliment from a neighbor who is fiercely independent and does exactly what they want to do, irrespective of the interests of the rest of the world. So, what did... Aha, that's a bad screen. I am going to use a number of slides. Don't worry. You don't need to look at the slides. The slides are there for two purposes. It is to entertain those people that like slides and sees can quickly grasp a visual message. And the second reason why it is there is in order to brag, you know, in order to show that there is very much more behind my simple words than those simple words. For those of you who do not like slides, just listen to what I say. You know, the important stuff will be said. And then we go. As Tony said, 50 years ago, my friends and I wrote a small book called The Limits to Growth. This book warned about overshoot and collapse at the global level. It presented 12 scenarios for the world from 1970 to the year 2100. Six of those scenarios were sad scenarios where something went wrong in the 21st century. Either there were too many people or too little resources or too little food or too much pollution. And six of the scenarios were scenarios where humanity managed to organize a certain degree of sustainability in its affairs, you know, so that you didn't get the overshoot and collapse uh, phenomenon. The book did not predict the future. It didn't say what will happen, because that was at the time scientifically impossible with the amount of understanding we had of social systems at the time. So all we could do at the time was to advise the world against 
the obviously sad scenarios, the overshoot and collapse scenarios, and then say, why don't you try to pursue sustainability? We didn't call it sustainability at the time, we called it equilibrium or no growth, things like this. But sustainability came 20 years later as the label. What did we recommend? We simply said, mankind, please remember that you're living on a finite globe. So please organize your lives so that you do not conflict with this totally obvious fact that we cannot have an endless number of people and we cannot have endless amount of physical resource use uh, per person. So, what has happened since? Uh, the short answer is, as Tony uh, said, the world has essentially followed its normal path, namely the average of all of those scenarios we made uh, 12 years ago. And recently there is a lady who has done science on this. So she has taken the four most important scenarios in the 1972 book and compared it with what has actually happened. So the colored lines on this, Jesus guys, universities shouldn't be allowed to have such bad, uh, what you call it, screens. Uh, okay, so the colored ones uh, are four of the scenarios. There are two sad scenarios and two positive scenarios. And the black dot, this is for the population development towards 2100. The black dots shows what has actually happened. And you can see on this graph that uh, the world population has essentially followed what we stated 50 years ago. Uh, you can do the same thing with industrial output, which is the closest we get in the model to the real GDP. And again, you see that the world has followed essentially the average of those four scenarios. You can do the same thing with slightly more exotic concepts, namely well-being. So that this is the Human Development Index, if some of you know this. And you see the very interesting fact that, yes, well-being, average global well-being has been going up during the last 30 to 40 years. But you are seeing a leveling off of the well-being development. The dotted, the black line is starting to flatten out, just like in the limits to growth uh, main scenarios. So, in summary, Yes, the world hasn't reacted very strongly to the limits to growth message. At least the first 50 years is tracking essentially the main core of the scenarios. The second conclusion you can draw is that we have grown into overshoot. You know, so we are now at a level, particularly in climate, which is way beyond the sustainable uh, level, namely the, the, the what can be absorbed uh, in the same year as it is being uh, emitted. Uh, let me take that a little more in detail, because the, what you can conclude from what we have seen over the last 50 years is that we have not run into resource limits. You know, we have not run out of coal, we have not run out of oil, we have not run out of gas. And there are, we have not run out of agricultural land. We, you know, many of the limits in the limits to growth has not been exceeded to the extent that this is a global affair. The only where area where we really have overshot is in the area of climate. We are every year now emitting twice as much CO2 into the atmosphere as is being absorbed in the oceans and the forests of the world during that year. So this remaining half, you know, sits in the atmosphere. And the, as the years go by, more and more and more of this thing is accumulating in the atmosphere. The concentration of CO2 rises and the temperature, you know, gets higher and higher. And we'll continue to do so, not only until we stop emitting uh, CO2, but we have to suck out, you know, the CO2 that is already added. The third conclusion from looking at the last 50 years is that we have had no overshoot. Sorry, we have had no collapse. You know, so the curves are going up, but we haven't seen yet 
you know, a rapid decline in the population or a rapid decline in anything else. And fourthly, we have seen some positive developments during these last 50 years. For instance, the number of children per woman in the world has declined on average from three and a half to two and a half. And as a consequence, the population bomb has been stopped. The world population will peak around nine billion people in another 30 years. Uh, and so the population problem has been solved. Also in the area of energy, Energy efficiency has increased tremendously during the last uh, 50 years. And you have also positive developments in popular attitudes. You know, more people at this point in time are interested in green issues than 50 years ago. And perhaps as important, institutional development. We now have uh, people like Maria who are actually ministers of issues that did not exist 50 years ago. So, at least there is some positive uh, developments. But, what is, in sum, the current situation? Well, the current situation is that in the rich world, the most serious problem is climate. And if you look at most of the world, namely the six billion people that do not live uh, among us, poverty remains the problem. So we have two problems at this point in time, climate and poverty, global poverty. This graph is interesting because it shows the annual emissions of CO2. And you may notice, or you will not notice, that it, we have now spoken about stopping the growth in annual emissions for 30 years. The IPCC was you know, the established in 1988. And one should have assumed that since its sole purpose is to get this curve to level off and go down, you know, one should have been able after 30 years to see some indication that this is not continuing growth. It is still going up as we are speaking and as we're running the umpteenth COP. You know. So there is a lot of talk and absolutely no visible effect on global emissions at this point in time. Yes, European emissions are going down slightly, but of course compensated for by increased emissions in China, who has taken over the production that we're just outsourcing. So this is really, it doesn't work. Uh, the next question then is, so we have overshot, we have not yet seen collapse. We see that the climate sector is where you know, the limits to growth thesis is being tested most clearly. So you can ask the question, what is going to happen during the next 50 years? Uh, and um, what we did three years ago when we started planning for the 50-year anniversary book, which is called Earth for All, uh, is essentially to say that we are observing that human well-being is leveling off. We fear that it is going to continue down. So we decided to make a study of human well-being during the next 50 years. And so we did, and as Tony again said, you know, three, two weeks ago, we published the German version of this report. It is already in the fourth printing. They have printed 30,000 copies in two weeks. So luckily, it seems that we managed to get through, and I'll tell you later why we got through, how we got through. Uh, and the American one came yesterday, I think, uh, 20th of September, that's perhaps two days ago. And so we are in the early stage of trying to send our new message uh, to the world. This, uh, uh, this study of well-being is deliberately the head label instead of GDP growth. We're aiming for a society that tries to grow well-being. And in order to do this in a proper manner, here is the definition of well-being that we have ended up using. 
So we're looking at well-being as consisting of five components. The first component is the disposable income after tax. The second one is the amount of public services available. The third one is the level of inequality in society. And the fourth one is observed damage. You know, it's the observed global warming. And the fourth one, the fifth one, is what we call perceived progress. Capturing the fact that if you have a society where well-being is going up, the mood and the political support to strong governments is much better than if you have a society where well-being is going down, where people start to worry about the future and start to do all the negative things that happens when there is no perceived progress. So this is our composite indicator, which we use as the performance indicator in our study. Most other people who build formal models use GDP as the goal, you know, because they say that total production of goods and services, you know, if it goes up, it's good. If it goes down, it's bad. We say that that is not true. It is the well-being of people that matters, not the GDP. We have built an impressive model, which certainly is not visible on this screen, and there is no need for you. This is just to brag. You know. This is just to show that this is an enormous amount of work, enormous amount of data. The only thing it does, it makes us sure that we present consistent scenarios, pictures where we do think about the effect if you tax the rich, the fact that they then have less money to invest. You know, we take this into account, you know, so that uh, you don't dream like most sustainability researchers do, you know, in some way or the other. Uh, fine. Uh, what happens? So this is the future in the situation where there is no extraordinary action. So as our base run, we look at what do we think are the consequences over the next 50 years if decision-making is done in the same style as during the last 40 years. So this is not... So in the system, decisions concerning family size are endogenous in the sense that they choose to have the number of children which the conditions in the model system says or indicates you know, at future, the societal reaction to pollution is dependent on the level of the pollution in the system at the future point in time. So think nothing is locked up. This is, you know, a, a model, endogenous, fully endogenous, except for some technological advance, uh, that calculates its way into the future. And so we believe that these are much less unreliable models than most models, which are either business-as-usual models or assuming a certain uh, policy change. Uh, so what happens in this run? You look at the, the top, the, the thing goes from 1980 to 2100. The red line is the global population, which starts, you know, passes the 6 billion mark in the year 2000, passes the 7.8 billion, that is the current pop, uh, 2020 population, and then it peaks uh, around 2050. Why does it peak? It peaks because women in the model system have gotten sufficiently affluent that they choose to have fewer children rather than uh, and go going to job instead. Life expectancy is of course going up all the time, reducing the number of deaths, but still the balance comes out so that we get a peak in the population around uh, 9 billion people in 2050. If you look at the blue line, the blue line is the GDP per person. This is the indicator that all economists are interested. In our view, the GDP growth is going to continue through the century, uh, relatively unaffected and more or less at the same growth rate as uh, observed in the past. Uh, the structural composition, for those of you who are economists, will shift, you know, we will shift from a dirty fossil-based ec uh, economy towards a green, renewable-based uh, economy aiming for, for uh, 
well-being instead of aiming for increased, uh, rapidly increasing GDP. If you look at uh, the sad things, you can see there is a solid line going up. This is the average temperature. So this is the global warming. And you see it starts from a low value in 1980. It passes through the plus one degree centigrade in 2020. And it levels off around two and a half degrees centigrade at the end of the century. So our business as usual um, forecast is that we will actually blast through the plus one and a half degrees. We will blast through the two degrees and we will then finally stop this madhouse at the end of the century at plus two and a half degrees centigrade. You can also see another gray line, which is inequality. This is the income of the richest 10% after tax divided by the income of the 90% poorest after tax. And you see that this inequality is increasing throughout the, the run because this is an inherent uh, as the characteristic of capitalist societies of the type that dominate the world, where wealth you know, tends to concentrate on fewer and fewer hands as long as you maintain competition and all the things that is the dream of democratic market economies. Uh, the sum is the green line, which is the well-being index, and you see it increases, has been increasing over the last uh, uh, 20, 30 years with the big business cycle swings, uh, and then it starts a decline you know, towards the middle of this century, 2060, and then it stays low throughout. And there is no mystery in this, you know, so uh, the income is going up, the social services are, are going up, but the climate is getting warmer and inequality is getting worse and worse, and so the sum total of this is a well-being that declines, and as it declines, the hope for the future declines, and so it further declines, and then what happens in the model system is local uh, social collapse. You don't get collapse because of environmental reasons and not at the global level, but you do get national breakdown, basically, when people really get pissed off. And so that is, this is the future. We call it too little, too late. All the young researchers in the project say that we are easily going to pass the political decisions necessary in order to solve this problem. I am 77 and a depressed man, so I say this is not going to be easy, but we should still try. So let's see what it takes you know, to make well-being in the model system not go down, but you know, perhaps increase a little bit further in this uh, century. For those of you who know, see in front of you a technocrat, whom you do not trust. You know, I've put in a small paragraph for you because you, at this point in time, would like to say, Mr. Randers, and you should please entitle me Dr. Randers, not like this lady who calls me Mr. Randers. I'm the most highly educated person on the surface of the earth. You know, so Dr. Randers, even with your competence and with your arrogance, you know, is it possible to make a mathematical model that says something of importance or significance about the next 50 years? And my answer is contrary to most model builders in the world and contrary to most economists of the world, a resounding yes. It is possible to say more than nothing. What you can say something about our trends. It is not possible to predict events at particular things in the future, but you can say something about trends. Why? The reason is that if you start looking at data in a proper manner, you can find stable relationships between human behavior and the income level. The one which is behind the clouds here shows the GDP per person along the horizontal axis and the energy use in physical units, million tons of oil equivalent per person per year. And all the thin lines are the various regions of the world over the last 40 years. 
And although the precision is not very high, you see that as when you start as poor, you use little energy. And then as you get richer, you use more and more energy. But for those of you who doubt the Kuznets curve, you know, notice in the United States of America, the, one of the richest economies, the per capita consumption of energy has been stable for the last 40 years. And in my country, which is the stinking richest country on the surface of the earth, with, you know, we produce more hydropower and more oil and gas than you know, is ethical, decent, etc., etc. In our households, the electricity use per family has been going down for the last 20 years. Why? Because we introduce heat pumps, which are efficient, you know, and uh, so. so. The important point is that energy use does, per person, does actually stabilize when you get into the $30,000 uh, uh, per person per year, approximately the level of Finland. You know, you are at the starting point of, of this flat plateau, if my memory is correct about your GDP, calculated in 2017, our purchasing power parity, dollars. And since none of you know what is the unit, none of you can give me the number of hand, but if someone could, it, I, I guess it must be 30,000. Norway is 60,000, US is 50,000, Europe on average is 40,000. I presume you are at the European average or perhaps a little bit below, meaning that you're getting close now to the point where energy use per person no longer increases, if measured not in dollars, but in physical units. So I've tried to convince you that this is a too little, too late uh, scenario. And you can start, and I've said, that the basis for making forecasts like this is simply heroic assumptions put into a system, and then you try to see what is a consistent uh, you know, future. What should be done? So I'm telling you that the most, if we don't do anything particular, uh, well-being is actually going to decline on average in the world over the next uh, 50 years. So, what should be done? And that's, of course, the main topic of the new book, the Earth for All book. What was it called? I am not in the, that, the marketing team. So they call it a survival guide for humanity. That's fancy. In my mind, what we're doing, we're prop we have discussed back and forth what are the five most important actions that humanity should put in place if they want well-being, you know, to not go down, ideally level off or, or go a little bit up. And these we call turnarounds, just to have a label that people might remember. So we are discussing and arguing in favor of five extraordinary actions for humanity. And the first one is poverty, the poverty turnaround, this is to make sure that all poor nations on the surface of the earth actually reaches a GDP of $15,000 per person per year. You know, India is at four, Africa south of Sahara is at two. You know, so there is a huge job of good old-fashioned economic development that needs to take place in the poor end of the spectrum. Maximum old-fashioned growth, you know, and growth in material consumption and growth in everything else in order to remove undignified poverty that has existed, you know, for a much, much too many years. And mind you, you know, the rich population is 2 billion. The poor population, the one that are below 15,000, is 6 billion. So for three for three quarters of the world population, the climate issue is much less important than poverty. And that's the reason why the poverty turnaround is at the top. How does one achieve rapid economic growth in the third world? The only thing we say publicly, and then I'll say afterwards what I say privately, in order to... So publicly we say that we cannot 
continue to use the development methods that we have been pushing for the last 50 years because they don't work. What have we tried to push onto the third world over the last 40 years? It's, of course, the Washington Consensus, the World Bank type of solution, public austerity, you know, free competition, illegal to support infant industries, you know, all those things that makes it absolutely certain that a poor country cannot develop has been the textbook. So the point is that we have to throw out the Washington Consensus, and that means throwing out the market solution, and that means supporting strong government. All of these things is, of course, to bomb the So we say in Norwegian, what does is this in English? I don't know. And so it is heresy, you know, what we are presenting under point number one. Personally, since I have been working for the Chinese over the last 10 years, the Chinese have eight doubled the GDP per person for 1.3 billion people in the last 40 years. So at least there exists on the surface of the earth techniques that is capable of doing what needs to be done for the six billion remaining poor people. Yes, I know at once when I say I like China, you know, people stop listening because they think Uyghurs, Hong Kong, Spratly Islands. And it's impossible to get a meaningful discussion. And so my colleagues never mention China in this context. They say, look to Costa Rica, you know, which is another way. And I would say, look to Sweden and Norway, particularly from 1945 to 1965, a period where 200 gentlemen in Oslo made all the decisions on behalf of the people and built the welfare state of Norway in those 20 years before the right-wing parties took over in 1965, you know, and you know, slowed down the, the real move towards a collective and, and a egalitarian society. The second one is the inequality thing. That's very simple. It's take from the rich and give to the poor. So this is just transfer legislation that you know, mandates. Uh, empowerment is the third one, which is also very simple. We know from the past 50 years that if you make available to everyone education, health, contraception, and opportunity, you know, then the women very, very quickly rise to decent positions and choose to have a job rather than having children at all. So this is so the empowerment one is very important, both because of human rights issues and egalitarian and fairness issues, but also because it really solves the underlying problem of population growth. Food, we you know, survive well. We produce in the world more than enough food to feed everyone a decent diet, even at the current level. The art the problem is that this way of running agriculture destroys biodiversity in, in the process. So we need, and it also leads to 15% of the climate problem, so we need just to change agricultural and forestry procedures so that they get more climate friendly. And the fifth thing we have already spoken about, that's the energy sector. There is only one thing we need to do and that is to phase out the use of coal, oil, and gas and replace with renewable energy uh, and energy efficiency and carbon capture and storage. So the final thing I add, because when you do the calculations, you can see that it is not enough only to move the world to wind and sun and introduce maximum electrification. You actually need to, buy, to capture some of the carbon that comes from the industrial use of heat in order to make the world come at plus two and a half degrees centigrade at the end of the century. If you don't use the CCS, you end up at three. You know, so it's, uh, this is what is called net negative emissions in the, in the lingo. So these are the five TAs. What do they cost? You know, because since it's, it's so obvious what needs to be done, why has it not happened? Of course, it hasn't happened because this is slightly more expensive than doing nothing. And it also has the side effect that 
you lose jobs in the dirty sector before you get the green jobs. And so people fear this thing because that it threatens their income. Uh, the cost of doing this, we estimate, along with others who have tried to estimate this, at between 2 and 4 percent of global income. And what it amounts to is essentially to taking 2 to 4 percent of the labor and the real capital of the world, shifting it from dirty production to green production. So in clear talk, it means to take the Vatsila yard workers, you know, or sorry, the easier to talk about Norwegian yard workers, who are currently producing oil platforms and diesel uh, ships, and just ask them to produce floating platforms with windmills. The same equipment and the same talent, and this is what the shift from a dirty economy, fossil-driven, GDP-oriented thing, to a sustainable one amounts to on the ground. It's simply a shift of workforce from dirty activity, unsustainable activity, to sustainable activity. And the amount is surprisingly small. You know, it's a few percent of the total income, which means that it is not difficult to ask the rich to pay because the 10% richest in the world control 50% of global income. So if you want them to pay 2 to 4%, it means that you need to add to their income tax roughly 5 percentage points. And that's what it takes. So tax the rich, give the money to the government, who then pays people to create a sustainable future for the majority. Am I elected? And the reason is, of course, the fact that most people hate taxes, and they hate the state, and they hate regulations, and consequently, there is no way a democracy is capable of making the necessary decisions. Uh, uh. Oh. I still have three minutes left. Unreal. I thought I was far beyond the, the deadline already. Then I'll take the two last points. Uh, so what, what is this? What does it amount to? So what do we need to do? Well, first of all, this amounts to a transformation of modern economies from economies that use fossil energy in order to increase the GDP the value of annual production of goods and services as fast as possible to an economy which uses labor and capital to increase the well-being of the masses instead. So it's a, a transformation. It's not, you don't need to throw out the system. You just need to, as I said, you know, shift. This is a structural shift from dirty to clean uh, activity. The problem is that this is not profitable from the business point of view. You know, so shifting the worker from doing the dirty job where there is a high labor productivity, high income per man year, into one of the green things where the income is much lower. You know, if the, it had been higher, you know, then the capitalists of the world very quickly would have invested in these things. They don't. And we know uh, from 40 years that they're pretending that they're doing this, and the banks are now greenwashing themselves, and everyone is doing all the... Luckily, I've, I've been the chairman of three banks in my life, so I know this, and I have sat on the Sustainability Council of three horrible multinationals for 15 years. Dow Chemical in, in the United States, British Telecom in London, and uh, AstraZeneca, which is somewhat closer to, to home. And just to see, you know, what one is doing on the inside is very helpful. Then at least you understand what's going on and can call a spade a spade if you don't get your salary from them. You know, which is an important uh, point uh, on many scores. So we need to shift investments from dirty activity, coal, oil and gas, into other things. But it is not profitable to do so, so the market will never 
put sufficient income. So how do you do it instead? You take the money from the rich, and then you invest it. The government invests it in non-profitable activity, which helps the world, instead of having them invest it in things that makes the problem bigger. It is collective action that is necessary, in my mind. Voluntary, individual action does not suffice. The free market will not do this. A regulated market could do it if you dared to put in place... Um, uh, Perfect. Uh, I forgot where I was. I'll, I'll come uh, yeah. If you dare, thank you. So what is the... Now comes the end. I know you must follow. So, what is the fundamental challenge at this point in time for sustainability workers and for everyone else? Well, it is to establish political support, public support, democratic support for higher taxes and more regulation. This is what is needed in order to solve the sustainability problem. And as I've said before, if there's one thing that people hate, it is higher taxes and more regulation. So in a democratic society, it is not possible to get this to happen. And consequently, one becomes a pessimist like me, with a smiling face in order to entertain you. The next question then, if the challenge really is to you know, get political support for something which is not liked. Is there any way in which you could do this? And the answer is luckily, yes. If you make sure that the people don't get a bill, you know, then it is more likely that they would be in favor of this shift. And if you also compensated those people that lose their job while they are finding a green job, you pay their full salary, the state pays the full salary, you know, then it is conceivable that you could do something. So then comes the question, is there any way in which the state could finance the system, the, the shift, the transformation in such a way that they do not send a bill, a tax bill, to the voter? Because then you might have a winning platform. You know, you could get a lot of votes for this type of platform. So then you must ask the question, how can governments finance sustainability action? How can they finance the five turnarounds? And there are three ways. There is more taxes, borrowing, or printing money. Higher taxes is Impossible if you want to have a democratic majority, but that's where we end up saying if you tax the 10% richest only and we know that they can afford it, you know, then you should get a democratic majority to support this thing. Of course, in the United States of America, which I love, I've lived in the United States and got my education there, but I love the America that existed in 1970, not the America that exists now. In the United States of America, there is no way you will ever get support for a strong government, a majority support. So the United States, in our book and in my mind, is lost. You know, they are on the peak, they were on the peak 10 years ago, and they're now gradually going to decline while China rises as the superpower of, of the world. The second way of doing this is borrowing. Who do you then borrow from? And that's where it is very important to always, in your mind, split the population in two groups. It's the owners and the workers, the rich and the poor. What is a worker? A worker is a person who spends most of his income every year. So there's only a tiny little difference. So when you borrow from someone, do, who do you borrow from? Of course, from the rich. So borrowing is the same as getting some money from the rich and pay the person interest rates back. And where do you get the interest rate? From the poor. So 
solving this true borrowing like the COVID thing did, you know, is yet another way of increasing inequality in society. So number two, borrowing is not a good idea in addition to the fact that you know this is postponing the bill to future generations. This is just like your nuclear plant, you know, where you dig down the, um, the residue and assume that, you know, 10,000 years from now, they will be happily still watching your repository. Uh, this is not criticism of the repository, it's the only way to, to handle it. But this, in principle, is, of course, shifting the bill to future generations. And then comes the final way of doing this, and that's to print money. So, of course, one could instruct the central bank to print an additional 2% of the national income, earmark the money, or green activity, so that it is being used to pay directly on the ground the guy who's building the windmill, or the girl who is making the solar panel, or the whatever who is tending to the old, you know, in a non-profitable uh, situation. This I am not allowed to say, because people get so angry when you speak about China, that if you also talk about the fact that it's very easy for a country that has its own currency, so Finland is out, but for a country that has its own currency to just print exactly the amount of money that is necessary in order to solve whatever problem uh, they want. Of course, modern industrial societies have legislation in the book that ensures that central banks don't do this. So it requires tremendous legislation change to change the goal of the central bank, and we know that this is going to take 30 years, you know, to get this to happen. And so we're back to the simple solution, and then I'll read it loud, and that is the end. Uh, the world has a problem. The prospect of declining well-being in the decades ahead, caused by global warming and rising inequality. The problem can be solved but it will require five extraordinary turnarounds paid for by the 10% richest in order to be politically feasible. And finally, what should you do? You should reduce your ecological footprint and support an active and well-funded state. Or somewhat more briefly, so you can put it up on a banner, electrify and vote for a red-green party. Have a seat. Have a seat. No. Thank you, Dr. Randers. Very good. Uh, you make it all sound so simple. Uh, you, I think you ate some time uh, and I know you have extremely long answers, even for short questions. So, if there's one brief comment in, okay, is it is it short and con condensed? The mic. So, thank you for the book. I was reading it 49 years ago because it was translated so quickly into Finnish as a schoolboy, and also the other books 10 years after, 20 years after and the third years after, all this translated into Finnish. So what do you think, now it is the academic elite here, elite pro problems, how you see that this could go to the lower level or to the people's level, so that this is not the problem of the elite uh, and trying to solve it? Because I think the whole success, besides that I did learn statistics and graphics from this book, the point was that it was teaching me learning skills. So, is this a problem of elite? So, very briefly, uh, this project, luckily, is, has two funding arms. You know, one is for the science, which has now been done. And then, luckily, there is millions and millions in this project, which is provided by family foundations all over the world to start a campaign. So for once, there is no 
professional people who are out there trying to muster public support for the solution. So follow, there is a web uh, page, you see earthforall.life. Just go in and become a member and look at uh, what is going on. And it's made by young people, so, or, well, that's not true. They're 50 years old. But, uh, so the, it, there is hope. Okay, thank you. Good question. Relatively short answer. Uh, we now welcome the panelists to discuss the topic of sustainable change. Dr. Professor Emeritus Randers will stay in the panel. In addition, we welcome a long-term politician of the Green Party and current deputy major of the city of Helsinki, who acts as the chair of Helsinki's Urban Environment Committee, Anni Sinemäki. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> nice meeting you, Dr. Randers. <laughs> Then we are joined by author and activist uh, Teemu Vaarakallio, who last year published the book Viimeinen siirto, Final Move, uh, that sought to understand the Finnish environmental movement and its role in the ecological crisis. Teemu, welcome. <laughs> and finally, we welcome Pirjo Kristiina Virtanen to the panel. She is professor of indigenous studies and docent of Latin American studies with the emphasis on the Amazonian region and research ethics of the indigenous research. Welcome, Pira. Thank you. Um, I'm facilitating the panel and I have the same questions to each of you and you take turns in answering it. Uh, I'm looking for one minute answers, two minutes allowed uh, per answer. And it's a simple question. What does sustainable change mean to you? Pirjo, could you start? Wow, <laughs> thanks. That's a very big, big question. <laughs> thanks, first of all, that you included uh, scientists coming from social sciences and human sciences. For me, uh, we, uh, the previous question was about the elites. For me, it's really more about our thinking, no matter where you come from. But our Western uh, way of thinking is, is really based on the ideas of binaries, nature and culture. And also uh, the scientists who are creating the theories of sustainability, well, what is it, sustainability uh, transitions and so forth, they are very anthro anthropocentric. So there are always at the core are human needs, uh, humans, uh, food, water, and so on. So for me, it's really about multi-species relations. It's about uh, relations of humans and more than humans. So it's such a radical change that I think there is something that, that we have to do. Uh, I'm skipping Jürgen, uh, coming back to you, but Anni, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, and it's been a great listening uh, so far. I would say as a, as a decision maker and pragmatic change maker that I think two things are needed, uh, clear goals and clear decisions. Uh, mainly I think that the clear goals have to be d derived uh, from the actual limits, uh, be it growth, be it CO2 emissions or be it uh, the level of well-being we want. And then the second uh, part would be a common and persistent change. I very much agree and I think that no individual can really alone, be it as a consumer or be it a voter alone or be it a powerful leader in a company, uh, no one can do the change really alone, but we need collective processes, common processes, uh, and lots of patience to be able to do the change. But that has to be combined with clear goals that people can uh, relate to, because otherwise it becomes too... Um, that it's too unclear the uh, path that we are walking. So clear goal and then uh, quite uh, sort of 
hard-working common uh, abilities to strengthen our um, capacity to change the way we do things. Thank you. Demo. Thank you. It's a great honor to participate in the panel among such distinguished academics as Professor Virtanen and, and Randers, and congratulations to the organizers as well for expanding and extending the focus of the panel to the societal changes. Uh, because to me, it's not a problem with science. The scientists have done their job. It's not a problem even which has to do with the uh, climate or ecology as such but actually the, the, the climate issues and the ecological issues, the biodiversity issues, are a symptom of a more deep-lying problem that has to do with our culture and with our politics. Mm -hmm. And therefore, for me, uh, sustainable change starts by struggling against the power asymmetries that are ma maintaining and reproducing uh, these consequences. Uh, and uh, what I want to see uh, uh, as a result of the struggles, I always, wanna, I always go back uh, to the principles of global climate justice movements that are the owners of this agenda. They are the people who are most impacted, they are the first impacted, and they are the least responsible of the suffering that our lifestyles in the global north and our economics are causing at them. That's why I always want to uh, base whatever I demand or I say, I want to base it on the principles of the global climate justice movements led by the BIPOC communities at large. And that includes uh, reinventing our relation with the nature, uh, acknowledging the sacredness of life, redistribution of wealth uh, between global north and global south, and human rights-based approach to ensure the uh, sovereignty of the people over their land, their forest, their water, and uh, investing in sustainable agricultural practices. Impressive, <laughs> impressive. Uh, Jürgen, do you, do you want to add or comment something on? So, very, very quickly, Piperio, uh, absolutely right, harmony between man and nature is, you know, a central uh, goal. And our contribution is our new model, which is the first one that treats the human world and the natural world in similar detail. You know, this thing is as big as that thing. Clearly, the natural world works on the human world in the model system as in the real world, and the human world influences the natural world. Like in the, so this is called a first version of an integrated global assessment model based on cause and effect relationships rather than uh, you know, an equilibrium or a regressed uh, correlation analysis. To you, Annie, about the goal, yes, we solidly agree, and that's why I spent one full slide <laughs> on average well-being. You know, how you define average well-being is totally determining what is good policy and what is bad policy. And, of course, you could choose any type of composition of that well-being index. We have chosen to be politically correct. There is something called the well-being alliance of nations that have decided to use well-being as their societal goal. And they have quarreled for some years about what should be the five components of well-being. And we have simply copied there. So, and to Temo, uh, I spent five years of my life as the Deputy Director General of WWF, which is, of course, pushing uh, by, uh, nature conservation in harmony with human beings. Uh, the global climate justice thing is totally central, and my contribution to that one is to remind you all that we are in a situation where the two billion rich people, namely you and I, we emit 70% of the greenhouse gases, while the other six billion emit 30%. So what is the future? The future is one where we reduce our emissions by one half, which gives room for the other six billion to double their emissions. You know, people think that it doesn't matter what the few rich do, it matters a lot. And so, 
the IPCC negotiations, in my mind, should only be among the rich. You know, getting the rich to half their emissions. And what should the rest of the world do? They should develop economically as fast as possible, ideally without emissions, but again, you know, if it takes emissions to do it in a quick manner, emit and just fill in the hole that is left by us retracting. And arithmetic is that way. You know, we should half our emissions over the next 30 years. They should double their emissions. And then we will still have exactly the same type of emissions in the future. Thank you. I think that one of the things perhaps that is missing in the Earth for All book is cultural diversity. We know that not everybody on this planet live or even aspire living in the same manner as we do here. So I would ask Pirjo first, that what can the over-consuming or the industrial nations and regions of the global north learn from indigenous and land-based communities and cultures? And what do you see as their role in the sustainability transformation? Right, for, for, first of all, of course, there are many sustainability models where social and environmental pillars, so to say, are at the core, or there are really these dynamic relations uh, shown. But for instance, I work with, uh, with people uh, for 20 years uh, in Purus River in Amazonian Basin in southwestern Amazonia, where the people don't have the concept of nature. Uh, the closest term would be uh, a forest. So the whole thinking is, is very different. So that was uh, really my point. And uh, what we can learn from them is this uh, uh, thinking of, the, of relations, like relational ontologies and epistemologies, so to say, that the existence is not possible without the others. No, also the same for knowing. Knowing is not uh, possible without the relations with other, other actors. Are they humans or other than humans? And with this kind of thinking, uh, indigenous peoples have managed to conserve 80% of global biodiversity. So they are managing, uh, protecting such a big uh, biodiversity of the world, and it's very much linked to cultural and linguistic diversity. And again, if we are trying to think that the universal models of sustainability um, are sort of the answer, or there are systems that we can um, design and we can apply them everywhere. For instance, if we take the idea of education, thinking that everywhere in the world people should be able to participate in, in Euro-American education, very often, anyways, this is the, the, the reason for losing the local languages and local uh, ecological traditional knowledge. So, um, uh, these indigenous languages, they embed uh, loads of uh, knowledge of how to relate with the, with the environment and what are the other time uh, spans, so to say. Uh, it's not about 50 years, it's about thousands of years. Just to take an example, for instance, uh, Elos Teatnu uh, movement, now you certainly have here heard about the Teatnu River, the Teno, Teno River um, in, in Zapmi area, and, and there were uh, different artworks and uh, different things happening, and the activists were talking about thousands of years. Um, the Sami activists say that uh, we have been uh, protecting these rivers for thousand years of the past, and we uh, we, we take this responsibility also to protect them for the next thousand years. So the time spans are also very different. And the idea is really to become a good ancestor of the future. So it's really beyond uh, the linear, linear time uh, thinking. So this is something for us to, us to learn. And how to measure uh, well-being. How to uh, measure, uh, how to say, uh, one of the core concepts, yeah, human uh, welfare. What is it? Is it really about the uh, cross? Uh, uh, is it about the G GPD and uh, having a place in the schools? What is it? So I'm for imagination, uh, thinking through uh, other other epistemologies and ontologies. I think the old system that we have didn't prove proven to be good. 
Now, we don't perhaps want to contrast different lifestyles, but uh, let's say an ind indigenous population in Amazonia, it's an entirely different type of living than city dweller in Helsinki, one of the most affluent cities in the world. So I would maybe uh, ask next from Anni, that how do you see city life amidst sustainable trans sustainability transformation, or how do you picture the city life in the future, which is necessarily not so much based on consumption and, uh, and sort of GDP-driven? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think that the change that we need um, most probably anyway will have to happen with different cultures and with different lifestyles. So, um, and I, I, I do think that it's a value as such that we would be able as humans to preserve and give space to many different lifestyles that can then uh, teach each other things or that we can be inspired or uh, have ideas from other lifestyles. I also think that a Western um, city uh, certainly belongs to the group uh, that Dr. Rangers uh, mentioned that our duty in a way is to actually reduce the emissions mm -hmm. uh, and do it rapidly and efficiently and in ways that can be shared and spread. Helsinki's goal is to reduce its own CO2, aerial CO2 emissions by 80% uh, from 1990 level till 2030 and to reach zero emission uh, level uh, 2040. At the moment we are in comparison to 1990 uh, in the level of minus 33% in the emission. So we have this... Uh, less than 10 years to reduce the emissions from minus 33 level to minus 80 uh, percent. So in a way I see that as our role uh, in, uh, in this sort of whole thing. And then of course uh, there are emissions and ways we do have an impact outside our area and also that we have to do that we use the tools that we have so that uh, it would be that we would encourage um, other players that produce stuff that we consume to uh, lower their uh, emissions. But um, if I think perhaps more culturally, the way uh, the city life, I think that, of course, cities are guilty, and also cities have a great uh, deal of uh, opportunities that it's easier to reduce, reduce emissions in a compact, dense city than it is to do it in a sort of scattered suburbia. In a city, people just take uh, much less space from the earth than uh, some other ways of Western living. living. And cities also uh, do form uh, naturally communities where it's easy to uh, have uh, cultural changes easier than in some, some other ways uh, that Western life has. So in that sense, I think that uh, cities are good, uh, good places for change. Definitely a point of meeting for the civil society and different kind of groups. So I guess this is a bridge to Teemu. Uh, but before that, I would say that my personal experience from research and Moreover, uh, more importantly, activism is that there is not enough people. We're always short of people and resources. So how do you see, Teemu, the future of civil society in enforcing and pressuring the decision makers and also making more noise on the streets? Well, to claim that I could provide a complete answer to that question would be to show that I'm completely incompetent to be here and uh, out of touch with the civil movement. Sorry, because, landmine, uh, landmine <laughs> question. <laughs> because uh, yeah, as much as there is a disagreement within the academia and the politics, there's of course a lot of disagreement and different uh, diagnosis and prognosis in, uh, among the uh, civil movements. But to uh, 
I guess, to cut corners and, and put it shortly, the civil movements are operating in the world of ideas, where I think they focus on the mobilizing more resources, that is, first and foremost, the people, but they also work uh, in the world of uh, materialism, which is about the politic, politics and the power and the conflict and even the direct action. And I think the, the emphasis has been in the world of ideas. We've tried to convince people that it's our common agenda, it's our common responsibility. We've been doing, not me, but uh, I guess other participants to this panel have been doing it for decades. And we must be critical, what have we achieved? Uh, not that much in terms of, of, of creating these narratives and, and mobilizing people. Of course, now from 2018 onwards, the mobilization has been uh, more successful again. We have seen huge protests, but the CO2 levels keep growing and we don't even almost mention the biodiversity loss. So how do we struggle against these power asymmetries between global north, global south, uh, human and non-human animals, uh, rich and the working class? Uh, at some point we have to, have to also uh, shift our focus to the material conflicts and, and, and political um, struggles. And we of course have seen a lot of demonstrations that serve multiple purposes. Even if a demonstration does not achieve their articulated goal, it can be a very life-changing uh, event for the individuals who then go on and engage themselves with different modes of activism and struggle. But we should not be happy with that answer. Of course, we need to more, do more, especially here in the Global North, where we, act, we owe to the Global South, and, and, and we need to uh, do whatever it takes, because we have the responsibility and the guilt also uh, to try to uh, uh, turn around or, or uh, destructive way of life. So then, what a the, what the lot of the, the movements in the uh, Global North have tried to do is also the strikes both uh, um, demonstrative and symbolic uh, strikes, but perhaps also production strikes. The, the youth strikes for climate have been mostly symbolic. They are probably not yet the societal issue. They are important in raising the topic to the public uh, arena of debate, but I think we need to be even stricter and think about ways of, of organizing production strikes as well to increase the, uh, the, the pressure on the politician's side. W well, that's not easily done because we had a lot of hopes about the unions and, and the workers and the syndicalists, but at the moment it's been difficult to mobilize the workers' unions uh, for this struggle. That does not mean that we should give up on it. There is still a great potential among the unions to join the environmental movement and, 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 and start putting a more material pressure on our political apparatus. And, and lastly, I must say that the people are losing their patience, and they are losing their land, and they are losing their lives. Increasingly and disproportionately, the indigenous communities, the land and environmental uh, defenders in the global south. And I don't know who is so naive to think that we're just going to keep doing the same thing and, and, that, and that we are not going to look for other methods uh, and ways uh, to struggle against this oppressive system. And, and now there is a lot of conversation around the world about the sabotage, about the more direct action against the energy productions. And uh, I think to preclude uh, any methods in advance is to negotiate on the terms of giving up. Andy, you had a reaction to them. Uh, yeah, I think that it's just good to remember or remind that uh, in a way one could say that uh, in a sort of closed system like uh, Finland or Helsinki, democracy actually works in its basic forms, that people demand things from decision-making and politicians, and many of those things actually happen. Not perfectly, but uh, there's a constant dialogue. And it's good to remember that actually uh, there's a constant pressure for politics and decision makers not to do things that would change uh, the way things are or not to do things that would cut emissions, uh, not to do decisions like closing a coal power plant. And that is just to, to have in uh, like next in line 
when thinking about demands for these changes, that there's actually an everyday ordinary demand, be it emails or uh, angry societies or chamber of commerce or just ordinary people who would not have to uh, that say that I don't, it's not fair that my parking lot here in the city center would cost 40 euros per month instead of uh, 26 euros per month. And in a way, as a separated thing, it's a small thing, but it's something that decision makers constantly uh, are confronted, the strong demand not to change too much. And that is why I think that there's a huge need for mobilization and discussion and uh, political imagination and uh, just uh, even if there's a general demonstration regarding climate goals, it's still a voice that somehow actually just counterbalances those voices who say that do not change anything significantly. Shortly, then. Just quickly, I wonder how can we call a democracy like Finland a successful project when, it, when to operate it requires four Earths? I think that's a huge problem. And secondly, on the second point, I agree. The politicians and the political system is stagnating, and we are not seeing the necessary changes that we need, and this is exactly why we need to mobilize, and why people, even the young people, have to take the responsibility of decision makers to bring up these changes. <laughs> Jürgen, you want to add something? <clears throat> I thought I spent most of my presentation coming up with an explanation for the obvious fact that very little has happened over the last 50 years. And I hope that you heard clearly what I said. This is because deficiencies in the human being, the short-term nature of the human being, basically, you know, which is the reason why politicians who have the right thing, thinking do not get support next time around. And this, of course, hampers the development. Just what you said, you just said it in slightly politically acceptable terms. I am increasingly with age, trying to say this clear and clear and clear, that what is the problem with Finland is the voter, it's the people. It's the same thing as it is in Norway, the United States, all of Europe and all over the place. It's the short-term nature of the human being which makes it impossible for us, you know, who sees the light you know, to force this view onto the rest of, of the people. That's my current hypothesis. Why do I say it no in yet another <laughs> way? It's first of all to irritate those that are not in agreement. But now it is for you to tell me, you know, if I am wrong, you know, what are the fundamental reasons why we don't get a broad popular support for the things that we have known mm. now for 50 years that we need to do. And that, as someone mm. said, the technologies have been available, you know, for all of these things for 50 years. The cost of the technology has come down dramatically, so that's an, an advantage. Still, we don't do this. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> and and you, yeah. No, no. <laughs> uh, before Annie, I would, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would ask Pirjo that are we humans all the same, or is this, or could this issue of short terminism be culture bound? Well, <laughs> I would say that many core concepts of our, our thinking, uh, like time, is cultural. After all, so I think uh, our cognitive systems are, ve are very different and uh, we can really cultivate our senses. Uh, cultivate our senses and this is very important that we can, for instance, uh, listen to the environment and the message messages it has. And um, I have to say that because of the theory and the message that uh, Jorgen is bringing is like, uh, it's very important because we have to do something something very quickly, and the message is clearly for the, uh, especially for the Western society. And what is the matter also with the Western society in terms of uh, how we have been trained 
is that we no longer uh, do not really know where the energy comes from, what are the flows of the water, or where our waste goes. We have kind of like a uh, great idea of that, but we are very distanced from those, from those processes. So, uh, uh, Ani um, <laughs> mentioned uh, everyday uh, normal. So, this is kind of like everyday normal, that we take it as a granted that we use um, electricity. It's really intertwined with our being, that we use different uh, machines and gadgets. So, this is something that uh, we need to be informed by, by the activists and, and other people, and then we need, uh, we need very strong policies. So, I do agree with all of what was uh, said earlier, but I, I think we really have to be aware of other ways of thinking as well. Anni, you wanted to say something, and then we'll come back to you, Jorgen. Mm. I think that um, one thing that sort of um, gives, uh, <laughs> makes things harder to change is that whatever the current situation, quite many people tend to stick to it. And what, whoever proposes that something would be done differently or changed has more burden of proving oneself. And this is sort of a, some kind of a disbalance that um, makes it harder to, cha to change things. And I, I also think that, and then I think that, in a way, they, I don't know what would be really the sort of silver bullet or one magic answer. Um, not even, I, I think that informing people certainly is not enough. People are, in many ways, uh, informed of many things. But I think that it's more like the question of political mobilization, action, pressure, certain stubbornness that, as a decision maker, you have to, in a way, endure that. Uh, if you want to change something, you get a lot of criticism and you have to go through a thing that uh, people tell you that uh, no, it's actually do not do the change, let's stick where we were. But I also think that one of the reasons uh, that was mentioned already in the, um, in the sort of plenary is that the well-being factor so far has still developed fairly well. So there are lots of people whose lives are actually now better than they used to be, and it's sort of lying behind the physical... Uh, fact that actually we are in some ways, if not on the brink of total collapse, uh, on the brink of uh, multiple collapses that are in a way happening at this very moment. Uh, but, but to balance that, there also are people that are really feeling okay with their lives. And, um, but, uh, but I think that... Um, I don't see a sort of simple answer that that's how it goes, but I think that it just needs sort of persistence and courage and, uh, and certainly towards the political decision maker, a lot of pressure is needed, uh, much more than now, because as I said, there is the counter pressure of not changing things. Jörg. At the aggregate level, I support now what I have heard from all three of you, because the challenge at hand is that most people currently, when asked to do sustainability action or to move in the direction of more sustainability, does the mental calculation and asks, is the cost involved higher or smaller than the benefit I get from this action? And so if we have a lot of time and a lot of observers, and a small city as opposed to the whole world, you know, in a couple of generations, clearly people would learn that certain of the things we do now, uh, which they're, because they're cheap, pays a price one generation into the future. And if you have a multi-generation experience, you know, you gradually will evolve social norms that actually also are very long term. And it is faster, you know, if you are in a tiny environment than in a bigger. And I'll, let me give you two examples, because I think this, you know, what is being said here about human attitudes and values. 
is important. Uh, the, the little kingdom of Ladakh, mountain kingdom, West Himalaya, is a high-level valley with a very constrained capacity to produce food. So, but wonderful quality of life because those that survive childhood has, you know, the very fruit threats, so they get very old. So population growth was, of course, 3,000 years ago, a huge problem. And how did they solve it? They decided that each woman should have many men because they understood very quickly that the number of women that actually generates the births, it's not the men. And so they changed the institutions of the country so that once one man married some woman, then all his brothers were also married to the same woman. And the excess women were put in monasteries. And this was a system that then over the thousands of years, balanced the population below the carrying capacity of Ladakh. And Ladakh was one of the cultural centers and religious centers of the world. Then came the Brits in 1850 and said, Jesus Christ, I mean, this is unchristian. This is really immoral. This is horrible. These women, you know, living with, etc., etc. And they managed to ban the system, you know, very quickly and enforce this is the autocrat coming in, doing the, you know. And of course, the whole thing exploded within a generation. The overpopulation was fierce and the whole thing sank into uh, oblivion. The other one, which is much more interesting at this point in time, is China. So China is organized according to Confucian principles and values, vertical Little brother reports to little sister, reports to mother, reports to father, reports to village elder, reports to county elder, reports to the etc., reports to the emperor, who reports to God through monasteries that are built on the top of these very elegant uh, Chinese uh, things. And this was done roughly 3,000 years ago in order to try to bring order in a huge territory where there were clans fighting like Finnish political parties. You know, endless fights about anything or Norwegian parties. And so they introduced the hierarchy, you know, in order to make it possible to run this huge thing. So what did Christ and us do? We invented this wild idea in the year zero that society should be horizontal, that each individual should have the same right, have the same value, and the same say on short-term, medium-term, long-term issues. And so we have a conflict now between two structures. The horizontal structure has been, which is loved by us because it has been around for 2,000 years, is now meeting the Chinese structure, which is vertical and loved by as many people, actually more people, because they're 1.25 billion. And so comes the conflict. And of course, we run in as the United Kingdom people in the 1850s. We say, come on, you cannot have a system where each person isn't exactly the same. You know, it's bad for you. This is immoral, cancerous, and uh, everything else. My advice on this one is, Jesus Christ, couldn't we, and, and Confucius, so I'm begging both, uh, uh, couldn't we just have coexistence? I mean, is it not possible to just say we run half of the world in this culture, and we run half of the world in that culture? There is no need to be a missionary to sell a system that we can easily see does not work. So... I'm for cultural diversity, and I am also for learning from experience. The really sad fact is that because we have been so slow in acting, we are now in a situation where your dear analogies and my dear analogies no longer work because we have a load individual people to generate eight billion people. Mm. You know, no one forced them to do this. This they did. 
to themselves because they liked it. They thought the short-term cost of having children was way below the benefit from the pension and the security and the social security. And so we are in a situation where we need other solutions than those that worked in Ladakh and in Amazonia in the past. That's a sad fact. And here is, I think, where scientists should shout to the politicians that, you know, fine, these old systems were nice at the time. You know, you should remember, in 1900, there was 1.6 billion people in the world. And that's only 120 years ago. With 1.6 billion people, you can easily do run societies with much lower labor productivity, much less stress, much more dispersed. When you force it to our levels of, of productivity, you need concentration in cities. And you want concentrations in cities because that's where the culture is, that's where the care is, and that's where the spouse is, and that's where the education is. And the richer you get, the more concentrated society is going to become until you get to the Norwegian stage, stinking rich people like me, very old, we move back to the countryside. You know, fine. That's, uh, so th there will be a counterforce in the end. Sorry for the long one. I promise not to speak anymore. <laughs> oh, oh, I know that you can't keep that one. Uh, uh, let's open it up for the wonderful people who have shown up and stayed here because the yep. air is quite thick already. So you can ask questions to... You can present questions to each or just single or, yeah, but let's start from you. I can run the mic. Uh, yeah, let's see. Yes, thank you for this um, uh, conversation, very interesting. And I have a question to Jorgen Ranzers. Uh, yes, I have been uh, reading the book. Um, it's Kasvun Rajat in Finnish the book you wrote many years ago. And I was just thinking this population growth is the cause of accelerating ecological disaster argument. And at the same time, you're also talking about like the global rich minority being most like responsible of like making this emotion, em like having a culture that is based on making a lot of em emissions. And I've read one this from this one book, it's called Climate Crisis Structural Racism, um, and there was this diagram, and also somewhere else I have seen this, that uh, the minority white population in Global North, that is something like 17%, is making like 66% of all the emissions from the year 1000, and what was it like? Uh, it doesn't matter, I know the argument. Yeah, 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 okay, okay, so it's, I said in Finnish, so, so on in go, 2007, okay, so in, like, so the white population is globally most, they make most emissions and have made like 200, 300, yes, so, when you say that the, the reason of ecological catastrophe is the growth of population, and at the same time you also say that the global minority of the rich people are most like accelerating the ecological crisis. So I'm just thinking that are there some spots that are not connecting in this argument of like the population is the reason. You know, because like if the minority is really like the reason of the emissions and the emissions is the big problem, so is the population then the big problem or not? I'm just not understanding this. So this is my question. I changed my mind. Let's take multiple questions and then we do a round of uh, answers. Thank you. Uh, you had a question. Because I think I did respond very clearly to that question. So, check your notes. Okay, um, Irina Herzon. Yeah. I, as a lecturer in this university, I work a lot with young people. And uh, increasingly many of them enter their adulthood very frustrated. 
anguished, even depressed. Yeah. Maybe not as depressed as you are, <laughs> Professor no, Anders. No. But um, your highly entertaining talk can be summarized in two sentences. We can move sustainable, we know how, but we won't. So what does give you hope? And others also can answer it. Electrify and vote <laughs> for the correct red-green party. You know, that's the only advice I give to my grandchildren. Um, I have a question uh, for Professor Anders. You mentioned uh, or indicated that uh, we are not going to be able to make the transition to the better uh, via dem democracy. So there are, as far as I understand, admirably many non-democratic countries in the world. So has any of these countries managed to make the transition? No, not yet, but the Chinese are really doing a better job than anyone else. Is this open? Yes. Okay, so uh, there is a small country in Himalayas called Bhutan, and I have been studying for some time already the, the situation in Bhutan. They, when they joined the UN, uh, they already decided long time ago that they don't need to uh, have economic growth. They have this development policy called cross-national happiness. And my answer, question is, um, how would you see the situation in a well of Western world if people were, let's say, uh, guided not to use so much money for buying everything and uh, trying to live a little bit more modest life so that this production of a different kind of whatever is being produced uh, is not creating so much problems. Thank you. And one more from the back and then we'll turn to the panelists. Okay, thank you. Um, so to Jürgen, I read your book during my here at the back. There are. Hi. Um, I read your book during my PhD studies just a couple of years ago, and it actually shocked me how um, how well thought out it was and and why the reaction to that wasn't greater. And I then learned that economists largely dismissed the book without clearly without reading it, <laughs> uh, and it has been argued in other papers since, uh, it's just not, not just my perception. So what do you think will be the reaction of economists now? And um, as a side note, um, in the model, like, um, can, it, can it somehow replace the models used by um, economists um, currently? Uh, and then are natural resources accounted for in the model? Your model, thank you. Oh, mostly Jürgen on fire here, so let's start from you, but try to keep it, uh, you know. I know, that's... <laughs> this is probably even more educational for the audience. You know, being me, who's trying to force a new worldview onto audiences that are steeply stuck in their old worldview, is a challenge which formally frustrated me endlessly until I started arguing that I insist on getting 40 minutes. I never accept speaking engagements that are shorter than 40 minutes, and I want to have a high pay, you know? <laughs> and this is in order to make people listen. Long enough that I first can tell them, you know, how bad your current worldview is, then what it should have been, and then we'll use the last 10 minutes to think about it, reflect. And that's why I insist on doing not what we're doing here, having a panel. One should have direct access to the questions 
just after, because that's part of the assimilation process, which is necessary when someone starts to talk about something which is not already generally accepted by the audience. And I'm saying this to you just to teach you something about the type of communication that will be necessary over the next several generations in order to change the ruling wisdom, the conventional wisdom that is really what is holding us back. You know, you call it culture. Uh, fine, I'm trying to achieve cultural change. I'm asked normally to do it in 13 minutes, you know, which I luckily know, say no. Then they want it for free, and I say no. You know, and, and, uh, and that's why I'm getting angry, keeping a nice suit you know, and a smiling face in order to have a maximum irritating effect on people that they actually start raising. Why, why did I then give this long answer? The reason why the limits to growth got famous was that the macroeconomists in the spring of 1972 did a huge strategic mistake. They attacked. They attacked after four weeks on the front page of the New York Times book review. A full page, hilarious ridiculization of this communist plot, you know, supported by idiot uh, European academics and uh, etc. Et and it, it, I, of course, still have this in my file, and it is, of course, written and copied in all the books about the reception, the historical books about how the limits to growth was received. It was so scathing, so you know, negative, that people started asking, what the hell has these guys said, have these guys said, you know, which make the guys so angry. So they started reading the book, you know, <laughs> and you're absolutely right. I think the three first actually read the book and just checked whether there <laughs> were prices in the book. And since there are no prices in the book, they concluded that this is not an economic analysis, and consequently it's irrelevant from the point of view of the high sciences of neoclassical macro. So what did we do now? You know, so we have repeated the message time and again every 10 and 20 years over the last 50 years with no effect. So what did we do now? Without the fact that we're still hated by the macroeconomists, I, being a 77-year-old academic of some reputation, has been asked once in my life to give a talk at the University of Oslo. I have never even been allowed in. And this is because Norway, the Ministry of Finance, the central bank, is run by neoclassic macroeconomists, who are, of course, ruling also the university. What did we do now? That's why I've sharpened the message. Tax the fucking rich. <laughs> you know, that's what, we, that's, that's what we're now saying. And it worked wonderfully in Berlin. You know, then the headlines all over the world, we, we, got, we, we got to one million readers in, in, in you know, a couple of hours after the launch. All quoting, you know, scientists say fuck the rich. Uh, not in those words, but that's exactly what was the meaning. So it worked. And now we are, of course, looking forward to the fierce opposition which is going to come not only from the rich, but from the macroeconomists who are going to say that if you tax the rich, who is going to invest in future jobs? Who is going to do... And it will come, they will ask the question, we need the rich in Finland, because if they flee with their capital, then there will be no more innovation in Finland, and Finland is going to decline. In I... my mind, totally ridiculous uh, argumentation. Sorry, Doctor. and then... Uh, 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 <laughs> Bhutan, I hope you know that Bhutan, which I visited first time in 1978, had the first minute discussions with the planning minister in 1978, and it have been all along. Bhutan is the most authoritarian society on the surface of the earth. The king owns the country. The king, of course, abdicated uh, 10 years ago and gave the power to an elected government. But you know how they do it. So they have a questionnaire at the beginning of a period where people 
fill in this form. You know how happy they are, they answer 110 different questions. Then the king appoints a prime minister. He gives him the state budget for the next five years and then asks him to come back with a solution which has increased the well-being. At the end of the five-year period, the questionnaire goes out again, people fill in, and then you judge whether the well-being has gone up or down. If it has gone up, the prime minister has the chance of getting one more period where he once more gets the state budget. They don't have taxes and things like this in Bhutan. It's a wonderful system. I had dinner the other year with the guy who was the prime minister and was at the end of his second period. You know, this is a wonderful system. It works wonderful. It's real autocracy put in place, but guided by the five annual, you know, vote. There is a reporting scheme. So, so I think it's the best example of a functioning society. This Finland could have done very, very, very easily, and Norway could have done it even more easily because we have this huge fund abroad that could have been used to give to the prime minister and give him five years with a government to just make Norwegians more happy. Dr. Randers. Yes, sorry. <laughs> and all our dear panelists. <laughs> When we were designing this event, we were worried that two hours would be too long. <laughs> now I realize it's too short. <laughs> and there are many more topics that have been raised in the chat and have come up around here, like regarding whether the donut economic model is good for us or like an answer to something. Uh, some of the problems, uh, whether the, the, the current uh, economic model that prevail the Western countries will be working in the future or whether these models have to be completely abandoned. And for example, when speaking about uh, green transition or, or like dirty jobs versus uh, clean jobs, uh, if that is, that is really feasible because uh, at least for some technologies we do not, do not have the raw, material, raw materials to do the to really make the transformation happen. For example, we don't have the battery materials for e-cars, for even for, for the first generation, and so forth and so forth. But I guess we have to continue all this discussion uh, around these tables here and, and elsewhere, and, and I hope uh, we are all more powered after this discussion and can move ahead voting uh, in good ways and, and, and so forth. And I really, really honestly want to thank all our, our panelists. You were really brave in you know, sticking your neck out and, 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 and uh, saying what you really think about things, like very bravely. And also to the very brave people in this audience. And of course, all those people who put uh, a lot of effort into organizing this, like in the first place, Tony Ruska here. And uh, then, of course, the uh, Finnish Club of Rome and uh, Helsus, which I represent, and Kela and Citra. So without any of these organizations, we wouldn't be here today. Thank you for my behalf. Thank you. Thank you. So you're free to leave, but I think it's only fair that the other panelists can say a word, a farewell. Uh, if they are not in a hurry to leave. So just a couple of minutes. I, th I'm sorry if the other call more steal, stealing time, but yeah, just to be fair. Uh, yes. uh, okay, yeah. well, you have, you have love I, I go back to the question about hope. I personally, I don't always understand the question. I don't know what's the connection between hope and action. I've not needed hope. I don't have a lot of hope. But if I play along and think what gives me something that resembles hope, it is that while we've been talking here, I've seen activists in the back of the room uh, uh, handing out flyers about the upcoming march uh, for the forests. And that's something. We are here talking and the people are still mobilizing. And that's why I also want to, want to invite and ask and require all of us who think it's about the mobilization and it's about uh, changing the general uh, public's opinion to participate this march on Saturday, right? Half past one on the Senate Square. Thank you. Uh, I, I would agree that that is uh, 
a good advice to participate uh, on the forest march. And I think that what gives me hope is that I have seen uh, political questions being brought to the agenda and solved. And although it's not so easy to see how really everything would be changed, I think that I've seen changes. People do the changes, put the pressure and decision making uh, function to, to, to the pressure. So I think that uh, we can do things. Even the pandemic showed that we can do things differently and act fast. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, thanks. So I just want to give this message that I hope that we will create more synergies of knowledge. So we really need to need from different perspectives. And the other thing is uh, there was a frustration mentioned because of the climate change and so on. So I, I think there's also kind of like a, what uh, Boyul Shul Han, a Korean-based uh, philosopher, has called that we are in the society of the achievements. We think that by consuming, we become kind of like entrepreneurs of ourselves, that we can go anywhere, we can travel, we can buy services and materials. So actually, this causes kind of like a burnout society. So I think it's also good to remember like who we are as humans and what makes us humans, also in non-monetary terms. So this is what I would like to say. Thanks. Thank you. Was it in Belge? Yes. Welcome to Belge.